introduce here, so I just want to introduce myself. My name is Charles Small. I'm the director of the Yale Initiative for the Interdisciplinary Study of Anti-Semitism. Um, we have we run a seminar series, and this evening is a special seminar. We usually have it in the afternoon, but tonight we're having it at 7 o'clock in part because Hillel Muir and I were in New York City today where Hillel launched his um, his report today on the United Nations and anti-Semitism, and he'll be speaking about that, as you know, tonight. Um, so very briefly, Hillel is a, a fellow Montrealer, both originally from Montreal, and hung out at the Hillel Student Society uh, a couple of decades ago together. Hillel uh, took over as the director of UN Watch, which is based in Geneva in 2004. Uh, he left private law practice to take up the uh, issues of monitoring the United Nations. And basically, the UN Watch monitors the UN based on their own guidelines, mission, and criteria, and, and takes them to task on, on several issues concerning human rights. And obviously, anti-Semitism and the demonization of Israel is just one issue that they take up. Hillel uh, graduated from Concordia University. Um, in political science. He has a, a BCL and an LLB degree in law from McGill University, and then he went on to do an LLM or a master's degree at uh, Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And it's a particular privilege and pleasure to have Hillel speak to us tonight on the United Nations and issues of anti Thank you. Charles, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you to the Yale Initiative for hosting me this evening to present a new report. We have copies in the trunk of a car somewhere, and uh, those who are interested can approach Charles and uh, tell you our report is called United Nations and Anti-Semitism. It was released a few hours ago in New York City, and we released it here at Yale University, and it has uh, also on the internet worldwide release and is being reported in the press as we speak. I'm delighted to see uh, Caroline Gross, a uh, former colleague from UN Watch, was a fellow with us. And she actually wrote the first draft of this report before she became a student here at Yale Law School. Anything you like in the report, you can thank uh, Caroline. And if it's something that you disagree with or you think is a mistake, I will take all the blame. <laughs> Anti Semitism is rising. If we look at the statistics issued recently by the Tel Aviv University's Stephen Roth Institute measures anti-Semitism. We see such statistics that as since 1989, anti-Semitic attacks have risen sharply, reaching their highest point in 16 years in 2006. The issue of anti-Semitism is urgent, it is global, and the question is what is the UN, is the world's premier global agency, doing about it? In June 2004, the United Nations held an historic gathering for the first time ever on anti-Semitism. Kofi Annan, then Secretary General of the United Nations, delivered remarks that were both candid and profound. And I'd like to share with you some of those remarks which we feature in our report in their entirety. This is June 2004, UN headquarters, gathering on anti-Semitism. And he said, and I quote, anti-Semitism has been a unique manifestation of hatred, intolerance, and persecution, a harbinger of discrimination against others. The rise of anti-Semitism anywhere is a threat to people everywhere. In fighting anti-Semitism, we fight for the future of all humanity. Mr. Anand went on to say that the Holocaust was the epitome of this evil. Six million innocent Jewish men, women, and children were murdered just because they were Jew Jews. This, that is a crime against humanity which defies imagination. He went on to say that the name United Nations was coined to describe the alliance fighting to end that barbarous regime. And our organization came into being when the world had just learned the full horror of concentration and extermination camps. It is therefore rightly said that the United Nations emerged from the ashes of the Holocaust. And the human rights agenda, he said, that fails to address anti-Semitism 
denies its own history. He went on to call upon leading UN agencies and officials to take action and confront anti-Semitism. Not only did he address the classic acts of anti-Semitism against individual Jews, he also addressed the issue of the United Nations, not only the United Nations' role in the fight against anti-Semitism, but he also acknowledged the UN's potential role, and indeed its actual role at certain times, in contributing to anti-Semitism. And he said as follows, quote, let us acknowledge that the United Nations' record on anti-Semitism has at times fallen short of our ideals. The General Assembly Resolution of 1975 equating Zionism with racism was an especially unfortunate decision. I am glad that it's, it has since been receded. This was Kofi Annan in June 2004, and he ended his remarks by saying, we look to our friends in civil society to keep us to the mark. And UN Watch is a non-governmental organization based in Geneva, Switzerland, presents this report today, which I will summarize for you, to hold the UN accountable to keep it to the mark. What has the UN done since June 2004 on this issue? Has it lived up to its promise? This is the first time that any NGO has released a report of this kind since June 2004, measuring exactly what the UN has done. We don't claim to be comprehensive, examining every UN action, but this is a, uh, a wide-ranging survey of key actions in the past three years. And I'd like to begin by noting noteworthy advances. This is not a report that is here to say the UN is anti-Semitic and everything is bad. On the contrary, there are noteworthy advances. I'd like to begin with those. Under the leadership of Kofi Annan, there were several noteworthy advances. He, he indeed followed up his commitment with action. And most notably, we saw following June 2004 a series of important UN gatherings and initiatives and undertakings, particularly on Holocaust commemoration. The Holocaust was the epitome of anti-Semitism and events that teach the world about the Holocaust, that commemorate the Holocaust, are by definition actions that counter anti-Semitism, that teach the lesson of how the Holocaust came to be. Moreover, with Holocaust denial, it's one of the classic manifestations of anti-Semitism today, led by President Ahmadinejad of Iran. Anything that teaches, educates about the Holocaust is, in essence, a form of countering Holocaust denial, and therefore countering anti-Semitism. And what we saw, I would say, three key actions by the UN since June 2004 on this issue. There was a historic special session in January 2005 that commemorated 60 years since the Nazi, since the liberation of the Nazi death camp at Auschwitz. And this was a major event in January 2005. It was attended by leading foreign ministers, including Joschka Fischer of Germany, Eli Wiesel, Nobel laureate from Holocaust survivors spoke as did Mr. Annan and others. Kofi Annan was eloquent, speaking how the United Nations must never forget that it was created as a response to the evil of Nazism. And that, that response is enshrined in our charter and in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Kofi Annan wants to say that, as Eli Wiesel has written, not all victims were Jews, but all Jews were victims. It was a, a very powerful day, and the first time the United Nations had ever done anything remotely similar in addressing the Holocaust. That day passed, but a few months later, it's, uh, it was followed up with another resolution that enshrined an annual day of Holocaust commemoration. I'll be honest, I was cynical, I was skeptical, I didn't think that the UN would handle this properly. There's a fear sometimes that you want the UN to do something, but then you give it the mandate, and the folks who have the power to execute that mandate may not be so friendly to the cause and may, may undertake it on their own terms. But I have to say that in the past two years, Holocaust commemoration 
activities held in New York City and in Geneva, which is the European headquarters of the United Nations, were meaningful and significant. And we saw uh, Holocaust survivor Simone Veil from Europe come and address the General Assembly, and other, a series of other important events. And all of these are meaningful. All of these are meaningful. You know, UN resolutions count. What the UN says counts. In America, there are many people who think the UN is silly, and what they say is nonsense. But the truth is, we talk about it in our report, that the United Nations is the, is the leading forum of international legitimacy. That's how it's regarded around the world. As U.S. Ambassador Jean Kirkpatrick wrote, UN resolutions define world opinion on major issues. Polls, global polls taken show that the UN uh, surpasses many other leading institutions uh, in society for the trust level that they, uh, that they have um, around the world, coming second perhaps only after NGOs. And so what the UN says counts. Its pronouncements are translated in uh, every official language and broadcast around the world. So when the UN speaks against anti-Semitism, when it speaks against the Holocaust, this matters. In addition to the annual Holocaust commemoration, there's also a Holocaust education program, which is doing important things. Just a few days ago, they announced an initiative with Yad Vashem, Israel's National Holocaust Museum, to train information officers throughout the world working for the United Nations to learn more about the Holocaust so they too can educate others. All of this is important, and all of these are noteworthy advances that followed the June 2004 session on anti-Semitism. We also saw that in a series of resolutions on religious intolerance and on racism, that anti-Semitism was, was for the first time mentioned, where they were never referenced before. For example, on religious intolerance in 2004, anti-Semitism for the first time was referenced. And as I said, these resolutions count. It also sends a message to UN officials throughout the institution that the issue is serious and that they should act on it. In a moment, I'll give you an example. I should say, of course, that not all these resolutions were adopted so easily. The resolutions that reference anti-Semitism were fought repeatedly by the Islamic states, the bloc of 56 countries, the Organization of the Islamic Conference at the UN, and they have repeatedly fought any reference to anti-Semitism. That's unfortunate. And then uh, further on, I'll come to some other campaigns that the Islamic group has been waging, which is hostile to the fight against anti-Semitism, undermines the fight against anti-Semitism. So to summarize noteworthy advances, we have a series of actions for Holocaust commemoration. We also have resolutions referencing anti-Semitism. Those are noteworthy advances. Other actions by other officials were mixed. Mixed grades, if this is a report card. We have uh, the experts on racism and religious intolerance. Kofi Annan specifically appealed to them and urged them to take action on anti-Semitism. The racism expert is Dudu Dien, is his name, and he deserves credit for <coughs> courage in resisting efforts by the Islamic group to curtail his ability to address anti-Semitism. The Islamic group passed a resolution saying that he could only investigate actions against Muslims and the defamation of Islam. It's a, a common theme throughout the UN that Islam has been defamed, follows the Danish cartoons, controversy, and there are repeated UN resolutions generating reports about the so-called defamation of Islam. And so the race of the was charged with reporting only on Islamophobia, but he had the courage to expand his purview and to include also acts of hatred against Jews and Christians as well. And one of the things he cited was not only Kofi Annan's seminar in June 2004, but also the resolution on religious intolerance, which he said referenced anti-Semitism. And therefore, he argued he had a mandate to address it. And so he deserves credit for that. He also deserves credit for confronting Iran when President Ahmadinejad denied the Holocaust and cited to the destruction of Israel, as he has done repeatedly in one international forum after another. And this is not a mistranslation, as some have said. He's had many opportunities to clarify, and time and again, he's called the Holocaust a myth, and one form or another is called for wiping Israel off the map. Well, uh, Dudu Dien, the UN expert on racism, confronted Iran in one of his reports to the Human Rights Council, and he made Iran answer for its crimes. Iran was forced to answer for the Human Rights Council, it was morally forced. It was not uh, physically compelled to be so, but because the expert on racism raised it in an international forum, Iran felt it had to answer. It gave 
one ridiculous uh, answer after another, but it had to answer because the UN expert raised it, and so it's important. For all this, we give him credit. At the same time, uh, we gave him mixed grades because uh, sometimes, in some of his reports, he's relied on expertise that we might call dubious. Dubious expertise in some of his, in some of his reports. I'll give you just one example, uh, primary example. Some six weeks ago in Geneva, a newspaper called the GHI, which is sort of distributed free, but widely distributed in Geneva, saw the following article, which talks about a new book by a woman named Esther Benbassa, a French academic. And she wrote a book called La Souffrance comme Identité. And she argues that uh, Jews have been falsely uh, creating uh, suffering as an identity, and that in Europe, in fact, although Jews claim to have had a tearful history in Europe. She says that this is, uh, this is a misrepresentation. In fact, Jews have had a privileged existence in Europe. I haven't read the book, but this is a whole spread about this book saying, in fact, Jews have had uh, a really fun ride in their 2,000 years in Europe. And I don't know exactly how she addressed the various burnings and expulsions uh, in, in all the various cities in Europe over uh, centuries leading up to the Holocaust. But that's her book. She is apparently Jewish. Uh, and this is, uh, gave a very wide spread. And then on the side of, of the article about her book is other stories that are uh, uh, portray Jews in a negative light. There's one about the World Jewish Congress, some nasty things about them, and then about the Khmelnytsky massacres in Ukraine, saying how, in fact, it wasn't Jews who were the victims, but others, and so on and so forth. So there's sort of a whole spread which uh, is uh, uh, borderline anti-Semitic uh, and cites this woman, Esther Benbasa. Now, when Duty Dien had a seminar on racism and anti-Semitism, one of the main experts that he relies on, experts on anti-Semitism, is Esther Ben uh, So, and, and indeed, he comes to the conclusion in his report that, among other things, uh, is critical of some of the leading advocates of anti-Semitism. So you have an event in a report meant to address anti-Semitism, and one of the uh, top authorities that he relies on is a woman whose main oeuvre is fighting the uh, advocates who fight against anti-Semitism and saying that it's exaggerated um, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, all of this is, is cause for concern and uh, that is a problem, as I said, when, when some UN officials take on something, they do it on their own terms and they'll find people who they want to cite and, and pursue it in the way that they want to. So that's a problem. The UN expert on, on religious intolerance is Asma Jahangir. She has raised anti-Semitism in a mission to France, a country that is, of course, uh, place that has witnessed a rise in anti-Semitism in recent years. And that was good. Unfortunately, on other issues, for example, textbooks in the Middle East, in Egypt and Saudi Arabia, which have documented, which teach children hatred for all non-Muslims, Christians, and Jews. When this issue was raised by several NGOs and hundreds and hundreds of people who wrote petitions online and asked her to take action, she did make some reference to it in the plenary of the council in one of her reports, but it was really a passing reference, and we're not aware that she's actually confronted Egypt and Saudi Arabia for teaching hatred to millions and millions of children. And if we want hope for a new Middle East, it has to begin with the textbooks, and unfortunately we haven't seen real action from her on this issue, and we hope that she takes action. So we have some UN officials with mixed grades. Okay, thank you. So we started with noteworthy advances, looked at some who got mixed grades, now we come to inaction. Inaction. There are several UN officials who, regrettably, we found in our report inaction on their part. One of them is the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Louise Arbour. Now, when Kofi Annan had his call to action in June 2004, he said, quote, a human rights agenda that fails to address anti-Semitism denies its own history. The leader of the human rights agenda is the High Commissioner, High Commissioner for Human Rights, Louise Arbour. She oversees the UN's efforts to protect human rights and to combat racism. She is uh, just recently, for example, appointed the Secretary General of the Durban Review Process. You know of the Durban 2001 Conference Against Racism, it was meant to be against racism. There's a new process called the Durban Review Process, and uh, the chair is Libya, it is chairing the process. Libya, of course, chaired the Commission on Human Rights in 2003, and in August, 
just a couple months ago in Geneva. Lydia was elected to chair, and Louise Arbour was appointed as secretary general. So her role is very important on these issues. And in our survey, in our analysis of her actions, we were unable to find, since she took office in 2004 until today, any noteworthy action on anti-Semitism. We, we searched and could not find, maybe we missed something, but we couldn't find anything. We wrote to them, uh, wrote to the Office of the High Commissioner asking for a list of any actions that Madame Arbour took or her colleagues. We got no response, we wrote again, we got no response, we called twice, we got no response. So to the best of our knowledge, we're unable to find any action whatsoever by the High Commissioner for Human Rights and Anti-Semitism. This includes uh, actions uh, about uh, Ahmadinejad, which as I said, a number of UN agencies and officials spoke out. Kofi Annan, several times, condemned Ahmadinejad's denial of the Holocaust and incitement to genocide. The new Secretary, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has done the same and deserves credit for that. Security Council has spoken out. The General Assembly <coughs> condemned Holocaust denial a few days after Ahmadinejad organized the Holocaust and denial conference in Tehran. Unfortunately, when 40 NGOs in January 2007, January 29, 2007, a group of over 40 NGOs, including Human Rights First, Freedom House, Democracy Coalition Project, the Darfur Relief Center, Methodist Church, and others, including Human Watch, asked the High Commissioner to use the occasion at the annual Holocaust Commemoration Day to condemn denials of the Holocaust by Iran. One of the outrages cited by our NGO coalition was a letter submitted by the mission of Iran to the Human Rights Council, by the Iran's envoy to the Human Rights Council, an official letter that was circulated as a UN document justifying the Holocaust denial conference and calling into question the Holocaust uh, itself. This obscene letter was circulated to all governments. It actually was done so by the Office of the High Commissioner, not because they were uh, being uh, malicious, but because that's just the protocol. But when we asked that this, among other things, be addressed, we got no response. This is a, deeply, a matter of deep concern, and I have no explanation for it. We did, on occasion, get a few responses, you and Watch and others, of private letters uh, expressing concern. Uh, for example, in 2005, on this issue, Madame Arbour was approached, and she did write back a private letter to you and Watch and its coalition, which included the Anglican Church, Socialist International Women and others, and she wrote back saying that she endorsed a statement by the Secretary, Secretary General um, of 27 October 2005. This is a weak, you write a private letter, it's not a public statement, but a private letter, and in the private letter you don't even say, I condemn the President of Iran for denying the Holocaust, but say, you know, by reference implicitly, I support such and such a statement. It's the difference between uh, calling someone a murderer and saying, I call you the word that's found on page 895 of the dictionary, of the Oxford edition. Uh, the concise Oxford Dictionary. So, at the UN there are levels of condemnation, and every government knows it. You know, in diplomacy there's a whole language, there's a whole language, and governments are very attuned to the statements that are made. And so, when governments see that the public denial of the Holocaust, incitement to genocide, which is the ultimate violation of human rights, when all of this is answered by public silence and by private letters that are at best implicit, this sends a message. And the UN holds the pulpit that, as I said, is valued around the world, and the, the highest pulpit of human rights. The High Commissioner needs to speak up, and so we're concerned that we haven't seen any action on anti-Semitism. We're also concerned that the representative of the High Commissioner in New York City, Mr. Craig McIver, when he attended a UN event about genocide and the Holocaust, when he was asked if he would uh, address uh, Ahmadinejad was about to come, this is in 2006, and Ahmadinejad was about to come to the UN, and he was asked uh, by a member of the audience what he had to say about Ahmadinejad and genocide, and one of the panelists gave a long, very a substantial response, very directly condemning Ahmadinejad and saying how uh, the conjunction of calls for genocide and nuclear weapons uh, were a serious matter requiring uh, all the world's attention. That was by Dr. Hamburg, the UN uh, expert on genocide, advisor to Kofi Annan. But then when Craig McIver, the representative of the High Commissioner, was asked, he refused to address it. He said, I, it's not something uh, that he would address. Uh, his quote was, I probably did not understand that question at all. And then at the end of his remarks, he, he actually 
um, in effect, admonished the person who asked the question, uh, and then compared the government of Sudan, said all governments, said all governments commit violations, the government of Sudan, the government of Iran, the government of Israel, the government of the United States. So equating governments that either uh, commit genocide or incite genocide uh, to those that have been the target of that incitement. So uh, again, all this is uh, a matter of deep concern. So as I said, we, we, it's an example of inaction uh, at the United Nations, and we should be especially concerned now that the Durban review process is coming up. Next category, after inaction, unfortunately, is obstruction of action. There are also, uh, at the United Nations, we find instances where action against anti-Semitism is undermined. And when you folks get our report, it's available online on our website, www.unwatch.org. You can find our report, and if you look at page 39 of our report, you will find that there is a campaign at the United Nations, which you may not have known about, by member states to redefine anti-Semitism. Let me tell you what happened just uh, two months ago in Geneva. When I was at the Human Rights Council, I heard the ambassador of Pakistan, Masood Khan, speaking on behalf of the 56-strong organization of the Islamic Conference, and he said as follows, a cruel form of anti-Semitism is Islamophobia. Uh, moments later, Algeria said, quote, a worrying upswing in anti-Semitism now targets Arabs and is extended by oversimplification to all Muslims. So anti-Semitism is not against Jews, Maybe against Jews, but it's also against Arabs, it's also against Muslims. This may sound silly and absurd, but in fact it's only the latest salvos of a long-standing campaign at the UN to define away the term of hatred for Jews. This is about corroding lang language and ideas and concepts. To just define away the term for hatred of Jews. And this campaign is waged by the very states who have the most to answer for. Now of course all this is nonsense. The word a Semite uh, is a classification of language, not of race or nationality. Anti-Semitism was coined in the 1870s by Wilhelm Marr as a euphemism for Judenhaus or Jew hatred, and that has remained, as you all know, the accepted term for hostility or prejudice against Jews. And yet, we see at the UN that at the Durban Conference, the NGO Forum uh, passed the following declaration, which said, quote, anti-Arab racism is another form of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. So this is repeated throughout the United Nations and pushed by uh, the Islamic group in Arab countries. Why do they make this absurd argument that anti-Semitism is against Arabs and Muslims? Well, it's not that complicated. Uh, Amir Rushdie, an Egyptian diplomat in 2002, rejected accusations of anti-Semitism in Egypt, and he said, because, quote, the Egyptians were more Semitic than the Israelis, having lived in their country for 7,000 years, and then he said the following year at the Human Rights Commission, quote, no one could accuse Egyptians of being anti-Semitic, since that would be a contradiction in terms. So absurd as this argument is, its function is clear. It's meant to be a shield for Arab states or Islamic states whenever they're accused of anti-Semitism. So it's impossible. We're Semites, we're the victims of anti-Semitism. How could we possibly commit anti-Semitism? And, um, you know, at the UN, uh, those who make this argument may or may not believe it, but there are many ambassadors from other countries who don't know very much about anti-Semitism, and these sort of uh, silly plays on words may actually resonate among them. Uh, or at best, maybe to sow confusion, so that whenever the UN does condemn anti-Semitism, the Arab and Islamic states can say, well, actually, it's about us. And there is sort of, uh, as we see oftentimes at the UN, this uh, odd uh, contradiction whereby uh, you just, you know, 10 NGOs wrote to complain to the Islamic, the chair of the Islamic conference, and he just wrote back, and he insisted that, uh, he said, he said, you, the 10 NGOs, including you and Watch, you have your interpretation of anti-Semitism, and you know, we have our uh, very legitimate claim. And uh, what it seems like, they, what they do is, on the one hand, these same states that, uh, that fight against any reference at all to anti-Semitism are the same ones who say they're the victims of anti-Semitism. You think that if they were the victims of it, they would want to reference it. So uh, it's a contradiction in terms, and yet this is a long-standing campaign at the UN, and it's pernicious. It's a pernicious uh, obstacle in the effort to fight anti-Semitism. If, if you can't name the hatred, how can you possibly recognize it and fight it? So that's obstruction in the campaign against anti-Semitism. And finally, we come to the UN's role 
in possible role in contributing to anti-Semitism. So not fighting anti-Semitism, not in action, not obstruction of the fight, but actually contributing to anti-Semitism. And here we come to the issue of Israel, a very controversial and heated subject. Is criticism of Israeli government actions or policies anti-Semitism? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Israel must be held accountable, it must be scrutinized, its government actions, its policies must be open to criticism by anyone, including the United Nations. The United Nations is obliged to hold Israel accountable like every other state. At the same time, it is clear, as Kofi Annan said, that sometimes, there are times when criticism of Israel, legitimate criticism of Israel, becomes something else, and it crosses over into something entirely illegitimate and demonization of Israel and of the Jewish people as a collectivity, using Israel as, the, as a mask. Kofi Annan said in January 2004 that, quote, no one should be allowed to use criticism of Israel's actions as a mask for anti-Semitism. And here he was speaking about intent, the intent of, of those who try to mask their intent. But of course, one could also, and I think for our purposes, just look at the effect. What is the effect of these UN resolutions? And in our report on page 42, we look at uh, leading authorities who address this issue. And this issue is clearly controversial, but it has been addressed by leading authorities. And I'll just cite briefly the EU's own definition, and then examine the UN's record. According to the European Union uh, Agency for Fundamental Rights, formerly known as the European Monitoring Center on Racism and Xenophobia, the EUMC, in a 2004 analysis on anti-Semitism, they provide a working definition and they provide that anti-Semitism can manifest itself with regard to Israel uh, in the following examples. One, when the Jewish people are denied their right to self-determination. For example, claiming that the existence of Israel is, in its essence, a racist endeavor. Second, when one applies double standards by requiring of Israel a behavior not expected or demanded of any other democratic nation. Third, when symbols and images associated with classic anti-Semitism, such as claims of Jews killing Jesus or blood libel, are used to characterize Israel or Israelis. And finally, drawing comparisons of contemporary Israeli policy to that of the Nazis. All of these are indicators where criticism of Israel may in fact constitute uh, anti-Semitism. Other leading authorities address this issue, including Walter Lecur, and Nathan Sharansky, former Israeli cabinet minister and Soviet a prisoner of conscience has a 3D test where he looks at demonization, double standards, and delegitimization. All of these, I think, have a common thread. They, they, they seek to address resolutions or other pronouncements that are fundamentally irrational, that do not seek to actually promote human rights, but seek to really just demonize Israel. And so the question is, looking at the UN's record in the past three years, how does it measure up in potentially contributing to anti-Semitism. What I'd like to do, what we do in our report, is just examine case studies of two UN bodies. One is the General Assembly, and one is the Human Rights Council, and just to look at the past year, so 2006-2007, of both, both bodies, uh, how they treat Israel as case studies. And just uh, by way of background, just for a moment, to uh, give some background on this issue, in 1975, as Anand had mentioned, the UN passed a resolution called Zionism is Racism. It was initiated by the Arab states together with the Soviet Union. It was adopted by a broad majority, although many democracies opposed it. Eventually, this pernicious text was repealed. The intent of that resolution was to strip Israel of its legitimacy after the Holocaust and the post-war world. Racism is the enemy of mankind, rightfully so, and if a, if a government, if a country is fundamentally racist, it has no right to exist, it is not legitimate. That was the intention of this campaign. That resolution was repealed, but regrettably, at the United Nations, there remains very much an infrastructure where the spirit of Zionism as racism lives. And it lives in a series of UN committees and reports and resolutions that together form an infrastructure that demonize and delegitimize the state of Israel. And if we look at uh, just the past uh, year, 2006, 2007, we'll find that the General Assembly the premium voice of world opinion in the United Nations, only a handful of governments and countries were singled out for censure. Only a handful of countries. So for one resolution, one resolution each 
Uzbekistan, Iran, North Korea, and so forth. Just a handful of countries. Israel was singled out for 22 resolutions. So uh, a handful of countries won each, and Israel had 22 resolutions. This has an effect. And the international forum, the world's premier forum of international law, condemns one country, one nation, 22 times in one-sided resolutions. All these resolutions are entirely one-sided. They make no reference whatsoever to uh, Islamic Jihad, to Hamas, to Hezbollah, not at all. These one-sided resolutions add up and, and contribute to this infrastructure of demonization. That's at the General Assembly. And in our report, there is uh, the most thorough analysis of each one of these resolutions. It's uh, appendices to our report on pages we found on pages 53 uh, of our report. And it looks at each resolution, who initiates these resolutions, and inevitably they're almost entirely introduced by the Islamic states, or by countries like Cuba. And there we uh, provide a summary and analysis explaining why these are one-sided and they're fairly obvious. These are one-sided resolutions. Even worse, regrettably, is the Human Rights Council. The Human Rights Council, uh, based in Geneva, Switzerland, the highest intergovernmental human rights body, was reformed. It used to be called the Commission on Human Rights. The Commission on Human Rights used to single out Israel in 50% of its resolutions. That body was reformed in June 2006. A new body emerged called the Human Rights Council. It was supposed to be better. In the first year since its inauguration, what has happened to the Human Rights Council? The number went up to 100%. In the first year of the Human Rights Council, 100% of its condemnations against countries were against Israel. Not a single other country, 191 member states, was referenced once. No other country was condemned once. Sudan was addressed, more reports were asked, there was no condemnation, and in fact Sudan was even praised and quoted for its cooperation. Israel was condemned by the Human Rights Council in 100% of its resolutions. If that is not demonization, I don't know what is. These resolutions, again, were entirely one-sided. When Hamas attacked Israel and kidnapped the serviceman Gilad Shalit, Israel responded. Israel was condemned in a resolution, in an emergency session. No mention whatsoever of Hamas when Hezbollah attacked Israel in the summer of 2006. Israel responded the same resolution, emergency session, accusing Israel of war crimes, not a word mentioning Hezbollah's attack. Many European governments that sometimes abstain voted no on these resolutions. They were that pernicious. And even human rights groups, which frequently criticize Israel, such as Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, uh, condemn these resolutions as biased. So for an entire year, first year of, of its, uh, its new manifestation, the Human Rights Council condemned Israel alone. This is Israel not as the worst violator, not only as the worst violator of human rights in the world, but as the only violator of human rights in the world. Nothing about Saudi Arabia, China, Sudan, and so forth. So that is what we see at the Human Rights Council. And my friends, I'll just give you one anecdote, and I have to wrap up soon. When I sit there at the Human Rights Council as the Executive Director of the UN Watch in Geneva with my colleagues, and I was sitting there last year at these sessions, and two things struck me, two moments of the fundamental irrationality of it all. And I'll just share with you two anecdotes. One of them is when, uh, a few months ago, I was sitting at a session, and I was sitting there with my laptop, and, and there were two, two realities. There was the reality of the debates at the UN Human Rights Council, and I'm reading on my laptop uh, of what's happening in the region, what's actually happening, and the two could not be far, further apart. This was a few months ago when Hamas and Fatah uh, were engaged in a civil war, and they were uh, killing each other. Uh, Dozens and dozens of people were being executed. Uh, Israel was not involved at all. Israel really took a step back and, and had no presence whatsoever in any of this. Hamas took over Gaza and remains in control of Gaza. And during this time, I'm reading on my computer screen, it was happening live that uh, people were being pushed off rooftops in the Gaza Strip, pushed off rooftops. Uh, uh, Hamas was going into hospital beds where the uh, injured, the wounded lay of of competing groups and was shooting them in the hospital beds, including in Beit Hanun, and walking around and shooting people as they wounded in hospital beds. And at uh, Islamic and other universities and religious schools were being firebombed and people were being shot. All this was happening, it was being reported in all these papers, and I'm looking at it on my laptop, and yet in the Human Rights Council itself, you were just hearing condemnations of Israel. And, and the hearing thing is, I'll just give you uh, a few quotes of kinds of things that one was hearing. One was hearing 
quotes like uh, from the Palestinian observer, quote, the Holocaust is going on, and it is an Israeli Holocaust against Palestinian people. I was hearing quotes like from the Iranian delegate, quote, there is an Israeli Holocaust against Palestinian people on a daily basis for more than 60 years. I was hearing quotes from a Syrian delegate, which is uh, fundamentally dehumanizing Israelis, saying that uh, civilians, quoting how civilian people were killed, massacred by the invading forces who have come from the planet Mars, which they now call the Israeli occupier. These were the kinds of quotes that one was hearing in the Human Rights Council. I'm looking at my laptop, and Hamas and Fatah are throwing each other off rooftops and, and shooting people in hospital beds and so forth. And not a word, not a word of it was mentioned in the Human Rights Council. So the irrationality of it was so striking to me. Just one other example. Uh, it, it, something quite remarkable. One of the one of Israel's harshest critics, and who really contributes to the demonization of Israel, is a man named John Dugard. He's the UN expert on Palestine. His mandate is only to review uh, Israeli actions, which are presumed violations. It's the only mandate of its kind of the Human Rights Council that addresses only one side of the dispute, and the only one that uh, presumes the actions and questions to be violations. This is John Dugard, and he relishes the mandate, and he says it's fair. So he is one of the the strongest critics of the UN of Israel, and yet, and yet, this summer, he wrote a report, very interesting, and he said, he said, you know, as a UN expert on Palestine, I asked the Human Rights Council a couple of times not to send me on these missions, because it made no sense, because it was already a year past, the, the issues that were addressed by these resolutions had already been uh, made moot by circumstances. He said, I already went on a mission, a general mission, which covered these issues, and yet, the Human Rights Council, was adopting one resolution after another, talking about a fact-finding mission from six months ago, from a year ago, and they continue to pass these resolutions, and he said it's entirely moot. And he said, I urge the Human Rights Council not to waste their time doing these resolutions. And the fact that they're only hurting my mandate, and that Israel allows him to go, he said, to Gaza, to the West Bank, but these resolutions only hurt him. And, he, and yet he was ignored. And he said, and yet I was ignored. So here is the UN expert in Palestine, uh, saying that these resolutions are either moot, irrelevant, unhelpful, and no one cared. The, the campaign is to condemn Israel one time after another, and the objective is not how to help Palestinians, and certainly not help, how to help Israelis, but not either how to help Palestinians. And you know, Amnesty International on this issue, and we'll just wrap up in, in a minute, Amnesty International released a report a month ago about Palestinians whose human rights are being violated. And you'll be very shocked that this has never been referenced, this issue, by any UN division on Palestine. There are many committees and divisions why is that? Because Israel is not involved. This is, uh, it's about pa Palestinians living in Lebanon. There are some hundreds of thousands of Palestinians in Lebanon. They are denied the right to work. They're denied the right to, denied the right to leave their areas. And Amnesty International wrote a report about this, a 31-page report. It has never been referenced as Palestinian rights. Never been referenced in any UN committee or resolution on Palestinian issues. If these resolutions were, as they proclaim to be, truly to help Palestinians, they would mention these issues, and they don't. It's a euphemism for the demonization of Israel. So when we look at the past three years, we actually see an intensification from 18 resolutions went at the G8 to 22, and the Human Rights Council from 50% to 100%. So regrettably, when we come back to Kofi Annan, we talked about the low point of 1975, of Zionism as racism, and talk about uh, how UN resolutions contribute to this issue, regrettably, we see regression. And uh, I just want to quote something from Kofi Annan, which is worth quoting, and to wrap up. Kofi Annan asked, he asked if, if, if all these resolutions do anything. And he said that, in fact, they do nothing but give the impression of, quote, bias and one-sidedness, and to some note in a non-quote, it seems, sometimes seems the United Nations serves the interests of all the world's peoples but one, the Jews. Uh, and yet, regrettably on this issue, he was ignored. Now, the one final issue I need to mention is, is what happens with these resolutions. As I said, they are, uh, they become perceived as expressions of world opinion. Some diplomats in New York, the General Assembly and in Geneva will say, we support these resolutions because real politique, we want to give the Arab state something for national interest, but you know, fundamentally, who really cares? These, are, these, are, these don't really matter. 
But they know that they matter, and they do. And, you know, we looked at, this report does this for the first time, that's ever been done to my knowledge, on page uh, 48 of our report, we actually opened up what happens with these resolutions. And did you know that in the Middle East, in Iran and in Syria and in Palestinian areas, the moment these resolutions are adopted, they are trumpeted by all of these extremists. Did you know that, that Iran's Ayatollah Rafsanjani dedicated half of his Al-Quds Day uh, mass rally when they chant death to Israel in, um, this was in 2006, last year, to UN resolutions saying that Israel is violating international legitimacy. And I want to give you one quote of, of, of how these resolutions are used uh, in state propaganda. Uh, Syria's uh, state media, when one of these resolutions was adopted, they immediately rushed to press to tell the Syrian people, and I quote, this is the Syrian government telling its people, quote, this reflected Israel's isolation and proved that our causes are just and enjoying broad international support. So when these resolutions are adopted, the extremists in the region, Iran, Syria, Islamic Jihad, we have a post here in the report, immediately take these and say, the world is with us. These resolutions are not meaningless. They are pernicious. Folks, to wrap up, it's been three years since Kofi Annan's call to action. We have seen some noteworthy advances in Holocaust commemoration, combating Holocaust denial. We've also regrettably seen some mixed record. We've seen inaction. We've seen obstruction, an attempt to redefine anti-Semitism to define it in a way, and regrettably, we have seen the demonization of Israel, which, at least in its effect, is contributing to anti-Semitism. Our report calls on the United Nations to live up to its promise. Thank you very much. We'll also agree to take some questions and answers uh, and some question period. And I'll start off, first of all, I want to thank you, Hello, for this presentation and also for launching the report today with us. It's a very important report and I think it's a report that appears to be, or tries to be balanced. So this is my critical question. There's something to me, for whatever it's worth, quite pathetic in the sense that it's taken the United Nations 65 odd years to speak out loudly and clearly about the Holocaust and the tragedies of the Holocaust. And it should never be minimized at all. And it is an advance at some level. There's something pathetic about condemning the genocide that took place 65 odd years ago when member states, states that are in charge of human rights affairs and that sort of thing, and communities in the United Nations, are actually engaged in spreading uh, or at least inciting the notion of genocide, the wiping out of Israel, the killing of Jews, the organizations like Hamas, Palestinian organizations, Lebanese organizations, Iranian organizations, and others literally, clearly call for the annihilation of Jews in their materials. So my question is, how, as an NGO, challenge you, how do you develop a, 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 an action plan? planning stages. How do you develop a plan to really confront, as you said and sprinkled throughout your, your talk, that this pernicious form of genocidal antisemitism? Is there a way to develop a plan to enlist the support of rational actors and states to try and deal with this horrible scourge? Thank you. I don't know that there is a, a magic solution, and clearly you raise a vital issue. We talked about the UN's positive contributions on, on addressing the Holocaust, and that's dead Jews. And we're all very sad about what happened to dead Jews. What about live Jews? What, what are you doing for them? And to be fair, uh, Secretary General Anna and Ban Ki-moon, and even the Security Council, did condemn Ahmadinejad uh, for, among other things, what was said against Israel, the site of genocide against Israel. It surely wasn't uh, often enough. It was one or two statements, and we wish that, it would, that these statements would come every time when the judge says that each, each infraction deserves a response. Every public uh, statement like that deserves a response, and so we haven't seen enough. But there has been some. So to be fair to, to the UN, and, and, and our report really tries to be fair to the UN, this is not uh, something to, to paint in a broad brush. Uh, at the same time, there are member states, and, and, and the UN, uh, the Human Rights Council, is reflecting the hatreds that uh, prevail in certain member states. Regrettably, uh, the Human Rights Council has become dominated by many of these states, supported by uh, dictatorships from other regions of the world. 
So what is the action plan? I don't know what, what, the, what the solution is. I can tell you what we're trying to do. And the UN Watch works with a range of coalitions. You saw that speaking on Holocaust denial, a range of religious groups uh, from around the world. Our letter to the Islamic, to the chair of the Islamic conference uh, from a few weeks ago was signed by uh, actually uh, an organization from Pakistan and many others, and Christian groups and church groups and, and women's coalitions. So there, there are many groups that care about this issue. Uh, it's not an isolated uh, issue. And the best that we can do is try to win over uh, the, the well-intentioned. We're not going to win over Iran or Syria and regret the other Middle Eastern states that are quote-unquote moderate. Unfortunately, in this issue, they've been harmful. But one would like to win over at least the democracies, and it's, it's not always the case. Regrettably, on these issues, a great democracy like South Africa and India votes for every Islamic resolution, no matter how incited, for their own real politic or whatever the reason, they vote for every resolution. Regrettably, the Latin American countries, almost every resolution, at least 10 resolutions condemning Israel, all one-sided, the Latin American countries, almost to a fault, voted for every, every single one. Now, Switzerland has voted against some, and Spain and others voted against yes others. So, regrettably, even democracies, for a range of reasons, uh, do not see eye to eye uh, with uh, NGOs such as ours on these issues, and that's deeply regrettable. We uh, take heart that uh, Kofi Annan uh, and Ban Ki moon have condemned the Human Rights Council in diplomatic terms. When the Human Rights Council instituted an item on the agenda for the permanent indictment of Israel in June 2007, and it's about to go before the General Assembly next week, and they'll either confirm it or overturn it, and 99%, 99.9% are going to confirm it. It's the permanent indictment of Israel on the agenda of the Human Rights Council. And ban Ki moon spoke out against it. And uh, when we, UN Watch, uh, referenced that and quoted him, Egyptian ambassador uh, rose to the floor and said, that's not what Ban Ki-moon said, but of course it is what he said. And in fact, the Islamic group condemned him a month later. He said it in June 20, 2007, a month later, at the Human Rights Council, the Islamic group and Egypt uh, got very upset. So when UN officials uh, speak out, their words resonate. And so the best that we can do is try to reach out to UN officials who are well-intentioned and get them to use their moral power the best that they can, and to reach out to democracies, some of whom have spoken out, but clearly not enough, and we hope that they will pay heed to our report. Our report will be sent to all 192 governments, and we hope that they'll pay greater attention to these issues. And just, just to follow up very quickly, um, there's some, there's a bit of a movement developing in Canada and Australia, and actually in the United States Congress. The 1948 Convention on the Punishment and Prevention of Genocide, Article 3 stipulates that incitement to genocide it contravenes the convention and that people, individuals or regimes engaged in incitement to genocide ought to be brought to trial. Is that a, a plan of action that UN Watch or other organizations give any credit to or credibility? Is this a possibility to pursue? Well, I, I think it's perfectly uh, appropriate and correct. The Genocide Convention is very clear about incitement to genocide and uh, President Ahmadinejad could not be more clear saying time and again to wipe Israel off the map. With the conjunction of uh, this race for nuclear weapons and parading Shiha missiles on the streets of Tehran, which say death to Israel. So it, there's really no secret here about what his intentions are, and I don't think anyone could claim that they, they didn't know in advance. And so from a legal perspective, and I used to be a lawyer, and I still pay my dues to the New York State Bar, so from, from a legal perspective, and the Yale lawyers can correct me, I think it's a pretty open shut case. The question is, uh, is this going to go anywhere? and so forth. I don't know that it's really going to go anywhere in member states that want to take this on, but I think the point needs to be made. And you and watch supports that we have ourselves been involved in the organizations that have been, and we support the reference, and clearly this point should be made. And if, if a member state, such as Canada, I know that uh, Professor Dylan Collar is, is trying to get to Canada, there's a parliamentary committee that has uh, raised this issue in Canada, we hope that governments would pick it up, absolutely. <coughs> Did you not commit yourself to put the moon and first say that you had the abilities that you wanted to have been articulating all of the problems that you did? Uh, I'm saying there's, there's a lot to say. As I understood you, you, you began by saying that there is a worthiness in having the UN, but then again, you enumerated time and time again all the problems uh, associated with its form of uh, mutual anti Semitic. Uh, sure, what happened. Taking the words uh, uh, of uh, uh, Joseph Goebbels, it, it, it's not 
Come along that long enough, where often enough, and people will believe it. Has the UN not just given audience to lies, but then it has given audience to truths, so that we have, in fact, maybe taken a step forward, but two steps backwards with regards to anti Semitism? Go back only a couple of years ago, after the siege of Janet broke out, Saeed Arakat, one of the Palestinian representatives, got on TV and said that there was a massacre in which tens of thousands of Palestinians were killed. After human acknowledgement that I think the total in the end was 73 people died in Genesis, he was interviewed again. And he said, what difference does it make? 73, 10,000, it was still a massacre. And that's all that people hear. And so what is being accomplished by giving audience to this type of rhetoric. Where do we benefit from at all? Well, I, I certainly agree with you that we don't benefit at all from any of this rhetoric. And in fact, uh, when I was doing some research, there, there was a, a conference held in 1986 about mm -hmm. uh, anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, looking at the Zionism and racism, racism resolution. One of the papers was a member of the U.S. Subcommission on Human Rights, uh, not a Jew, um, uh, he, he was uh, talking about his own experience being a member of this uh, uh, UN subcommission and hearing so many anti-Semitic remarks. And he said that oftentimes the presiding officer of other member states would say nothing. Uh, so, uh, and, and regarding the issue, that he wrote this article in 1986 and is still with us today. So clearly, all of those statements are not beneficial at all. They, they are pernicious and, and they promote anti-Semitism. They're terrible. The question is, how, to what extent do we judge the UN as a whole with it? The UN is complex. It's uh, we UN watch. Uh, support the UN's founding principles, we support the rule of the UN. We the, rule, the UN has a unique role in today's world. It's an institution that uh, can do so many things that no one else uh, can. Uh, that said, we're also one of the leading organizations in the world that's the foremost organization fighting anti-Semitism as well as uh, promoting human rights for all. Uh, so how do we square the two? Well, the, the UN is a vital institution, and yet it, it very often falls short, and there's no way around it. The UN is not going anywhere. Even if we, even if we didn't like the UN and thought it was all nonsense, and it's not. There are many good things that the UN does on, on a whole range of issues, whether it's world health, refugees, and many things. Uh, even if one thought the UN was all bad, it's not going away. The America, some people in America might wish it away, but it's not going away. It's there, and there will always be an international institution of its kind. And so, uh, ultimately, uh, we have to deal with this forum as it exists. And if it weren't the UN, it would be another forum. You know, these similar things were raised when, when the Red Cross meets, when the International Year of the Woman met in 1974. They said Zionism is racist and so forth. So it's it's uh, it's something that one has to. It's not a simple thing to be there at the UN to hear all these things, and and yet to to believe in the UN as an institution. It's, it's certainly challenging. We continue to do so, and yet we we try to uh, make it better uh, by building coalitions with governments and officials. And there's no simplistic solution to this. And the the, the, the terrible things we see at the UN reflect hatreds that exist in the world, reflect uh, the tyranny that exists in the world. In some, in some ways, I think personally, uh, I found it uh, beneficial for me, as someone who lived in Canada and Switzerland and the United States and other countries, always in democracies. And I, I never lived in a tyranny. And I don't know what they think. And you, you sit at the UN, you know what they think. They, they tell you. And it's actually very instructive. And you know that in, in these countries, they're telling people that anti-Semitism is not against Jews, or perhaps uh, you know, believe that the Protocols of the Elders of Zion is, is something that's, that's real. Uh, and so in, in that sense, what I mean to say is it reflects deeper problems. The UN, the UN is not necessarily the source of the problem, but clearly it, uh, when forms like these are subverted, the Human Rights Council votes 100% of its resolutions to condemn Israel, uh, it raises questions about its credibility, very deep questions about its credibility. Uh, and we just have to speak out against it. It's, it's not going away. The U.S., take the Rights Council as an example, the U.S. Uh, decided not to run for a seat. Uh, is, that the right, uh, is that the right approach? Uh, those who supported this approach said, how can, we how can we add credibility and legitimacy to an institution that has that completely failed? Not only in Israel, but that has failed on the full range of human rights issues. And I understand and respect that approach. The question is, is it making a difference? Well, the U.S. is not a member. They're just an observer, and they're kind of stepping back even further from being an observer. And is it making a difference? Well, it's going on. The U.S. is not the only country in the world, and it's far less uh, significant than it used to be. The Europeans, 
believe in this institution, and they're there, and this body goes on, and it says what it says. And our approach, actually, is the best thing, probably, would be for the U.S. to be in there, and perhaps to take the approach of Senator Moynihan, who, in 1975, was the U.S. Ambassador for the General Assembly, and when it adopted Zionism as racism, he said, the United States rises to declare that it does not acknowledge, it will not abide by, it will never acquiesce in this infamous act. I would like Ambassador Moynihan to be back at the Human Rights Council, but he's not. Well, let me just, let me just, uh, first of all, there is an American ambassador uh, who is there and, and does speak out, and we very much appreciate the work that he does, and America is outspoken, but I, I, what I mean to say is, I think perhaps in these issues, the best way to do it is to confront, to confront the, the, uh, the evils instead of uh, walking away. Sometimes walking away is important, uh, but from a permanent forum, may not be the answer. That'd be, sorry, that'd be sorry I'm not, I don't think people. Uh, maybe your last answer on um, this question moved, but I was just wondering that as Western democracies um, provide the vast majority of uh, monetary funding to the UN, you know, countries like the US and Canada and uh, France and Germany, um, how, what does the UN watch think about the monetary compulsion to equal opportunity to human rights within the UNCHR? I'm not trying to say, what do you mean by monetary compulsion? You mean by withholding funds if, if, if they don't behave properly? Yeah. Yeah, this is something uh, that has been attempted at times. It's actually happening now. There's an initiative in Congress, and I forget exactly where it's at. I believe the House already passed an initiative. I don't know if it's yet become law. But it seems like it had bipartisan support and so forth to do exactly that, to withhold funds, uh, withhold U.S. contributions to the Human Rights Council. And is this a good idea, and what does you want to think about it? Well, I think that at times the, the U.S. contribution, which is 22% of the budget, is important leverage. And I, I'm speaking personally, not for my organization, we haven't come up with a policy statement on it, so I'll just speak personally. Personally, I think there, there may be times when the leverage that the U.S. or other governments have with their money, with taxpayer money, can be used, and it can get the U.N.'s attention. And I think it, it, it has a role to play. But you can't over.